Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this session, which is a joint session uh, sponsored by the Center on Global Energy Policy at SEPA here at Columbia and also the New York uh, Energy Forum. My name is Ed Morrison. I'm chairman of the, uh, of the New York Energy Forum. Uh, the live streaming has begun, which is why we're beginning exactly uh, on time as well. Uh, today's conversation is really about uh, Iran post-sanctions uh, and in part about the oil market and how much oil is likely to reach the market from Iran once sanctions are lifted. Um, we're certainly able to engage in a conversation broader than that to the degree uh, those of you who are here want to uh, raise uh, other, other questions. Uh, we have two speakers. The first speaker is going to be Richard Nephew, uh, ne now currently also at the Global Center uh, at SEPA. Uh, Richard was formerly the Principal Deputy Coordinator for Sanctions Policy uh, at the Department of State, and he's going to share uh, his insights into uh, the mechanisms for removing sanctions. Um, Bijan Kasapur, who is a leading expert on Iran's energy sector uh, and uh, has a consulting company that is very well respected uh, and has been able to uh, get, engage in dialogue with uh, uh, both officials in Iran, uh, business people in Iran, uh, and business people around the world. He's written reports. Uh, their bios are available on your invitation and on the website. Uh, we're going to start with some comments uh, by Richard Nephew, then Bijan is going to carry on after that to focus uh, on the Iranian side, and then we'll open it up for questions. Richard. Thanks very much, uh, and thanks very much to, to Ed and Bijan for allowing me to uh, join them here this evening to talk with you a little bit about the Iran uh, P5 plus 1 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action and what it will mean for oil markets. Now, I think my task is a good deal happier uh, today than it could have been a few weeks ago because we have now passed the timeline for U.S. Congressional Review of the JCPOA. And I think as folks you know, here may be aware of and on the, the live stream, uh, U.S. Congress had passed a law in the spring that required a 60-day review period for any agreement reached between Iran and um, the United States and its partners. That timeline uh, elapsed on the 17th of September. Now, I think that said, that doesn't mean that it's the end of U.S. political intrigue on the nuclear agreement. I think as a number of people who are skeptical of the deal have already made clear, there are going to be continued challenges to the full implementation of the deal. There will be attempts made to pass new sanctions legislation that ironically would be aimed at both giving the Iranian government a hard time, but also helping those inside of Iran who are opposed to the deal to get the Iranian government to walk away from it. Ultimately, I don't think that these efforts will be successful. As the U.S. political system has already demonstrated, there's enough support for the deal to move forward. But that doesn't mean that both people here in the audience and online aren't going to see press reports about new bills moving through Congress that could imperil the deal. Frankly, I think that is going to be a constant through the life of the deal, so we should expect to hear that for the next 10 years. And this is in part because of the sensitivity of doing negotiations with Iran. It's in part politics. But I think ultimately it comes down to some unresolved questions about what Iran and the U.S. relationship and interactions are going to be in the Middle East and beyond going forward. I think for that reason, there are also going to be bills that will be passed that won't have the risk of imperiling the deal, but it will sure sound like it. And I think you should expect to see over the course of the next six months, maybe even sooner, legislation to uh, renew the Iran Sanctions Act even though that act will be basically put in abeyance as a result of the JCPOA, as well as new legislation that's intended to apply pressure on Iran for its support for terrorism and violations of human rights. I think ultimately, even though this legislation will pass and have some impact on Iran, I don't think that it's going to make the Iranians walk away so long as it is finally balanced and it doesn't trigger any Iranian red lines. For instance, denying Iran's ability to access international financial markets writ large, its ability to sell oil, its ability to receive oil and gas investment. Those are the kinds of things that I think could potentially trigger a collapse of the JCPOA and risk to future negotiations. But I certainly think there's going to be a lot of noise about this. I think there's going to be a lot of attention paid to it, and there's certainly going to be a lot of politics attached to it. 
Now let's take aside those issues though and speak to just the fundamentals of the JCPOA. We're basically now in the pre-adoption phase. What does that mean? So under the terms of the deal, the groups that negotiated this decided that there needed to be a wind-up period before implementation could truly start. And that was so as to permit domestic political cycles, review periods, and so forth, primarily driven by the US uh, timeline, but also driven by the Iranian domestic timeline. With the US legislative uh, issue now essentially passed, there is every indication that the sides will pursue uh, adoption day by the 18th of October. What does that mean? That means by the 18th of October, both the United States and Iran will have completed their domestic political processes so as to permit the deal to move forward. But also, that there will have been new sanctions regulations promulgated by the United States and the European Union outlining what will happen when sanctions are to be relieved. This is a precondition for implementation of the deal. It's written in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And those regulations are to be put forward by the 18th of October. By the 15th of October, the Iranians and the International Atomic Energy Agency are required to have completed the Iran phase of resolution of the past military dimensions of its nuclear program. That's basically Iran's effort to explain and answer for its previous work to develop a nuclear warhead and to answer a series of questions that were put to it by the International Atomic Energy Agency over a number of years and are specifically outlined in a report from November of 2011. As I said, that work is to be completed by the 15th of October. Assuming that it, it has been done so and that the IEA is in a position to say we've gotten the answers that we need so we can go off and write our report, then I believe Adoption Day will proceed with no further snags. And what that will set in motion is the Iranian effort to get its nuclear program in final shape before implementation. See, Iran will be implementing parts of the deal, but we will not have actually officially entered Implementation Day until after a number of very specific steps have been taken. Iran must, for instance, remove approximately 13,000 centrifuges from their installation points today. Iran must begin the modification of the Iraq heavy water research reactor, and essentially make sure that it could not be used for production of weapons-grade plutonium. Iran and the IEA must work together to develop the transparency and monitoring mechanisms that will govern the JCPOA going forward and will ensure that detection of any attempt on the Iranian part to engage in a breakout is quickly detected. And there are a number of other very specific steps that the Iranians will have to take, such as modifying their uranium stockpile and so forth. Those steps will take a lot of time. The Iranian government has suggested that it could complete all of them by the end of 2015. I suppose that is theoretically possible, but I wouldn't bet on it. The kinds of steps that the Iranians are going to have to take are very significant. They're very time consuming, they're very technical, and you don't want to do them wrong. If you do, you're going to have complications in your nuclear program going forward. When the Iranians have completed all these steps, they will invite the International Atomic Energy Agency to come to the various different facilities that are associated with it. And they'll ask the IEA to verify that the steps have been taken. When that happens, the IAEA will issue a report to its Board of Governors as well as to the UN Security Council basically saying, we have gone through all the steps Iran is required to take that are enumerated in the JCPOA and we can verify that those steps have been taken. At that point, those sanctions regulations I was speaking to earlier from the European Union and the United States will become effective. And basically, under the terms of the deal, the Iran nuclear-related sanctions ought to remain static from that point forward until October of 2020, at which point the UN arms embargo will fall away. And then they'll remain static again until October of 2023 when the UN ballistic missile-related restrictions will go away. Now I note that those are UN measures. US-related unilateral sanctions remain in place in both respects. But the sanctions relief that's provided for in the JCPOA is really that simple. And from April, in my guess, but potentially sooner, of 2016, Iran's oil and gas sector, its financial sector, its transportation and insurance sectors, all the sectors that have been subject to nuclear-related sanctions will be largely unencumbered aside, again, from very specific sanctions that will remain in place with respect to terrorism and violations of human rights. That doesn't mean, though, that implementation will be smooth or that the sanctions picture 
necessarily will remain static for all of those years. And there are a number of things that could happen along the way that could change it. First and foremost, there's the issue of snapback. And I think that this has been reported often in the press, but I'll outline some of the main concepts. When the United States and its partners were negotiating with Iran, they wanted to have some kind of way of responding to future Iranian cheating. Now, the way and the preferred instrument that was selected was the reimposition of sanctions that are supposed to be suspended and eventually terminated under the terms of this deal. And so, the United States and its partners established a very clear principle that if they were to decide that Iran is cheated, they reserve the right to put back in place all those sanctions that have been suspended. There is a dispute resolution process that is outlined in specific terms in the JCPOA. I won't bother going through all the specific steps just yet, but we can, of course, talk to them in Q&A. But the upshot is, if the United States or any of its partners believe that Iran has cheated, after approximately 60 days, perhaps a little bit longer, U.S. unilateral sanctions, European Union sanctions, and U.N. Security Council sanctions can be snapped back into place. And we'll basically return to the status quo of prior to November of 2013. Some have suggested that snapback will never happen. And I hope it won't, because I hope that the deal will be successfully implemented to its conclusion. But I would counsel anyone who's planning to do business in Iran or thinking about it to be very, very, very careful and very leery of snapback. It is there to be used if necessary. And if you make a lot of bets about the fact that it could never possibly be used or that political circumstances aren't right, or that Iran couldn't ever possibly do anything to trigger snapback, I would just note that the history of Iran's nuclear program started with the construction of undeclared uranium enrichment facilities. And so the possibility of that happening again, while I judge that to be slight, and I hope that it doesn't happen, it's not something that should be discounted, and certainly not in the confidence level we have with Iran's nuclear program to date. We'll only have confidence with Iran's nuclear intentions as we go forward. I'd also note that, again, while we are moving into implementation, starting with October 18th, we will not yet be implementing sanctions relief. So anyone who's planning to travel to Iran on the 20th of October to start signing a bunch of deals, I'd caution you to hold your horses. It is possible that the amount of time it will take Iran to do its various nuclear steps will take even longer than the four to six months that I would guess. It could take up to at least a year, at least according to U.S. government estimates. The best possible thing for businesses to do is to wait. You can have a lot of discussions. You can have a lot of interactions with Iranian officials about what could possibly come. But there are a number of different sanctions provisions that are even triggered when contracts are signed. And so I would be very, very careful if I was looking to do business with Iran to wait until sanctions relief has been officially triggered sometime in the spring. And don't worry, you'll find out when the IEA gets its report uh, together and submits it to the UN Security Council and to the IEA Board of Governors. And of course, there's always the risk of implementation crises. As I noted, there's the possibility of snapback prompted by Iranian violations of the terms of the deal something that remains a risk. But there's always the possibility that implementation will break down over something starting here in the United States. If, as I already mentioned, there is an overreach on the U.S. part with respect to terrorism and human rights related sanctions. I personally do not believe that the Iranians will take any sanctions punishment that's meted out by Washington, and that at some point the Iranian government would withdraw from the JCPOA if it felt that Washington was going too far. And that, of course, would trigger an implementation crisis and the potential, regardless of how it started, for sanctions to all come sweeping back. Third, there's always the possibility that Iranian economic mismanagement will continue even without sanctions or with sanctions relief. Now, I was one of the originators of the Iran sanctions effort in the U.S. government. I worked on it for a good long time. And I don't think there's anybody in the U.S. government sanctions effort who wouldn't say that we got a lot of help from domestic mismanagement of the Iranian economy by President Ahmadinejad. I don't anticipate that President Rani and his team are going to do the same and have the same kind of mistakes. He's put in place a number of very good economists and technocratic officers. That said, it's a big economy to turn around. There are a lot of bureaucratic problems. There are a lot of reforms that are needed. And so the possibility of future economic mismanagement continuing and causing problems for the Iranian economy is great. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have an implementation crisis in the JCPOA, unless there were to be a decision that it's much easier to blame the great Satan than it is yourself for having the problems that you're having. 
And I don't think it's beyond the Iranian political system to look for a scapegoat in the form of the United States and any even modest sanctions that are imposed by the United States during this period dealing with terrorism and so forth. And so to me, there is also a hidden risk that not too many people are talking about, that Iranian economic performance may not be sufficient to meet the rise expectations of the Iranian people. And in that circumstance, politicians tend to reach for the easiest button. And I think blame the Americans is a pretty good one, which could lead to an implementation crisis down the road. Now, the best thing to do to mitigate and manage these crises is transparency. And that's part of the reason why the Joint Commission was established under the Joint Conference and Plan of Action to deal with implementation problems as they come up. That's problems both on the sanctions relief side, in case sanctions relief isn't working quite right, or on the nuclear side. It's my hope that the Joint Commission will be a place where all the various different implementation problems can be raised and dealt with diplomatically and avoid any of the implementation problems that I spoke to. I think the United States took a very important step in this regard by appointing someone like Ambassador Steve Mull to serve as our coordinator, based in the State Department, of all the U.S. government's agencies that are responsible for this. And I hope that each of the other parties to the P5 plus 1 and Iran also correspond with the U.S. decision by appointing senior level coordinators who are able to meet with their presidents and senior officials in their parliaments and other structures to deal with implementation problems as they come up. Because senior level coordination and clarity and transparency are the things that are going to see us through any transparency or implementation problems that come forward during the implementation of the deal. Ultimately, I think that the deal will be implemented and be implemented successfully. I think that there are some risks that are out there. Those risks can be managed. Those risks can be dealt with. I think that if you're a business out there, you have a special responsibility to deal with those risks from your own perspective. But I think the key thing will be to watch very carefully for what is coming out of Washington, what is coming out of Tehran, and to judge what the business climate looks like as you're looking at implementation. Because while certainly there is going to be a period of sanctions relief, and hopefully it'll be an effective one, there are also going to be rocky patches. And I think that it's going to be very important to watch and see where the winds are blowing as we go into all of those patches. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Richard Bichon. And I invite you to Thank you. go up there so we can watch your slideshow. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and it's great to be here. Let me find this. Uh, is it? Oh, I oh, there it is. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, what I wanted to start with, Richard already covered. Uh, thank you very much. and. Uh, Without any coordination, we have actually similar uh, timelines, at least for the JCPOA. So I will show you my timeline in a minute, but I will also focus, obviously, on the developments in the Iranian petroleum sector and then continue with um, my predictions for um, how uh, the post-sanctions petroleum sector in Iran will uh, impact the global markets. And it won't just be oil uh, production, it will also, there will be also gas, petroleum products, and petrochemicals. So Iran is about much more than just oil, and we have to analyze uh, the impact. Uh, timeline, Richard explained everything very clearly. 18th of October is the next benchmark, that's the adoption date. Then Iranian rollback will start. In fact, yesterday, the secretary of the Iranian uh, National Security Council, Mr. Sham Khani, said Iran has already started its implementation and I do believe them because they there is actually a very good reason for the Iranian government to uh, accelerate the process because we actually will have parliamentary elections and also actually two parallel elections on the 26th of February 2016 and the ideal implementation date for the Iranian government uh, would be somewhere in the middle of February because then they they will benefit from the positive momentum of of implementation date. Uh, but uh, I won't spend more time here. My prediction is similar. Richard said April 2016. I said quarter, first quarter 2016. I think it's realistic in the first four or five months of 2016 to see uh, the implementation date. Uh, moving into analyzing the Iranian situation, first a quick snapshot of the Iranian economy. These three columns are, um, I don't know if there is a, Oh, yes. 
these columns are, this is the, 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 the previous Iranian year, which ended on the 20th of March. Uh, this is the current Iranian year, and this is the next Iranian year. I just wanted to share some things. First of all, the Iranian economy has actually l left its uh, uh, stagnation uh, process. The last two years of the Ahmadinejad uh, era were actually years of economic decline, partly because of the mismanagement that Richard mentioned partly because of sanctions and other issues. But it is now growing at a, at a reasonable level, about 3 to 5%. Next year, the predictions go towards a, a, a GDP growth of about 5%, which would be good. Still below what the Iranian economy actually needs because of the demography and the situation we have, the Iranian economy actually needs a, an annual growth of, of about 8% to create the type of jobs that uh, the demography d demands right now, but it's not there. But a couple of other points. Uh, when you take the Iranian GDP at nominal, uh, nominal figures, it's about 350 to 400 billion dollars. But when you take the so-called purchasing power parity figure, it's closer to one trillion dollars. And I always say that the upside of Iranian economy or the Iranian business potential in the next decade is the difference between these two figures. Because as subsidies will be lifted and, and distortions will be uh, taken out of the economy, the economy, the, the nominal figure will approach $1 trillion, and that will be really the, the, put the future potential of this economy. The red figures that I have here are the negative phenomena in the Iran economy. One is inflation, even though the Rouhani government actually has managed to contain inflation very successfully when Rouhani took office in 2013, annual inflation was up at about 40%. And it's now down at around 15 to 16%. Uh, but as you can see, it's not going to drop much further. Uh, and that's partly because of the subsidy reforms, partly because of the impact of um, the economy opening up and so on. The other negative figure is unemployment. And here again, we have a situation, unemployment level at about 10% official unemployment and about 16, 17% unofficial unemployment. And the difference between these two is what I call underemployment. We have a phenomenon of underemployment in Iran, which means educated human resources can't really find jobs for, for which they have been trained for. The positive news in Iran, in the Iranian economy, is that the fact that the economy is producing a, a, a sustainable surplus. And this sustainable surplus at about 25 to 40 billion dollars a year is actually going to grow once Iran exports more oil and gas and other products. So it's important to, uh, to understand that dynamics. So let's look at the petroleum sector. What has happened in Iran over the past decade or so as a result of the, the external sanctions and the pressure on the Iranian petroleum sector that Iran has actually moved from being an oil producer to being in the meantime, not just an oil producer, but an oil and gas and petrochemicals producer, but also a producer of, of or a manufacturer of a number of the machinery and equipment you need in the oil sector. Obviously, a country like Iran, when you say, we are going to sanction you and we are not going to sell you these equipments, Iran is not going to sit back and say, well, I'll just wait for the sanctions to be lifted. They started producing a number of these equipments domestically. Uh, I always use the the car analogy, uh, the, the Iranian industry is producing at a, at a sort of medium level quality, uh, like if you want to, in, the, in a car analogy, the Peugeot and Renault technology is available, but the BMW and Mercedes-Benz technology is not available. So this, we are looking at, a, at, an, at an industry that's emerging as a med medium level uh, industrial uh, backbone, which obviously plays a role in the capacity building in the oil sector as well. Um, obviously, the, re the sanctions regime, the, the sanctions, especially the sanctions over the past five, six years, have had a, a, a huge impact. Have, Iran ha could not export as much as it was producing, so it had to drive down production. And obviously, it could not get the, the technology and the financing that it needed in the, in the development of, of its petroleum sector. But interestingly, as you will see in a minute with the production figures, the country actually managed to increase its natural gas production at a very, very interesting pace. Uh, 
And this is important to understand because one of the key sentences I'm sharing with you tonight is that the story of Iran over the next decade is not about oil, it's actually about gas. Iran is going to be one of the largest gas, gas producers and gas hubs in the world. And in fact, if the developments uh, continue the way they have continued, by 2020, Iran will be the fifth largest gas market in the world after the US, China, the European Union, and Russia. Iran will be the fifth largest. And this is significant, especially what Iran will do with this gas. This, I, I will come back to that. So let's just look at some figures. Uh, these are just uh, statistics. Um, just for you to note, obviously you know about the reserves. Reserves are relatively large right now. Uh, Iran's oil production is, at, is about 3.5 million barrels a day, about 1.2 million. This is basically uh, oil and natural gas condensate or liquids, basically. Uh, and about uh, exports at about 1.6 million. This includes also the condensate, as I said. Gas, uh, I will show you the production development, at, uh, but right now, the, the production volume is 190 billion cubic meters a year uh, and rising. Uh, and just uh, on, as, as a side note, uh, since last year, according to the BP Statistical Review, Iran actually has the largest natural gas reserves in the world. So Iran uh, has the reserve base, uh, but it's still not one of the major producers. It will have to catch up. Uh, Imports and exports are relatively negligible, so most of the gas produced in Iran is actually used domestically, and I will get back to that in terms of the, the and this is exactly the point, the um, domestic energy basket. About 70% of Iran's domestic energy consumption is gas-based, is natural gas-based, and one of the reasons is they want to allocate as much gas to domestic use as possible to free up oil and oil liquids uh, and products for, for exports. Um, so the growing gas production, as I said, um, is making more crude available. Uh, but at the same time, Iran is also expanding its domestic refining capacity. This was one of the responses to the uh, sanctions on Iranian crude exports when Iran could not export crude it decided to invest more and more uh, in refining capacity, especially in, in, in mini refineries, so-called mini refineries. In the meantime, the oil price has dropped and the margins in the so-called refining activity have dropped, so some of the investments may be delayed, but essentially the, the, the objective was to increase refining capacity and to be able to export more products rather than crude oil. Um, um, and we have had just since we are talking about energy consumption, we have had subsidy reforms in Iran. Uh, they started in 2010. They are still in, in, in the process of removing subsidies, but the, the, the fact that subsidies are being removed and energy is becoming more expensive has had an impact on at least containing the growth of domestic consumption of energy, which, which obviously also makes, again, more oil and gas available for export activity. So when we look at the, the export situation. Before uh, the, the sanctions hit, uh, the last wave of sanctions hit in 2012, Iran was exporting about 2.3 million barrels a day of oil. Uh, as I said, it dropped uh, and at the lowest point was about a million barrels a day of exports. Since the interim deal was signed in January of 2014, Iran managed to uh, increase exports, especially exports of condensates. But this is basically the graph that we are, we, we can see now. Uh, sorry, I don't know if, yeah. Um, so this is where we were before sanctions hit. Then exports dropped. The, the lowest point was about a million barrels a day in 2000 and end of 2013, beginning of 2014. And then ever since that has gone up. And I think this, this path of growth will be roughly what we will see. Um, there is a lot of talk that as soon as sanctions are lifted, the Iranian petroleum minister was on the record saying as soon as the sanctions are lifted, Iran will export one million barrels a day more. I think that's exaggerated. Uh, obviously, any, any oil producing country that with the experience of Iran could suddenly hike production 
but it's not a sustainable one. And they also have some reserves uh, that they could sort of hit the market with. But essentially, if they did that, they would actually shoot themselves in the foot because th it will have a major impact on prices. So my prediction is, and there are more and more experts who say that Iran will <coughs> grow its <coughs> exports gradually, re recapture some lost market share, and I will show you where that market share will come from. And some of the exports potential, crude export potential, will also be dependent on refining capacity domestically. And that's why the second, the next graph is more important. This, is, this, is, this shows you the overall production level, which was at about 4.3 million barrels before these sanctions hit. Then production came down up to even 3.3 million. Of, some OPEC figures even show the figure of below two, 3 million, about 2.9 million barrels a day of production. But one of the functions of how much oil is available for export is domestic <coughs> consumption of oil. And domestic consumption of oil is on the one side declining because there is more gas available for domestic uh, consumption, but on the other side increasing because there is more and more refining capacity. So Iran's crude oil uh, exports will uh, be back at about maybe um, at best by 2017, back at the level where it was before the sanctions uh, hit. But Iran's petroleum product capacity will be higher compared to 2012. And this is important to understand. So when we talk about the impact on global markets, we have to look at crude on the one level, but also look at some of the petroleum products, especially some of the petroleum products where the domestic consumption is declining because of subsidy reforms. For example, diesel is, a, is one, of the, one of the products that is becoming more and more available for, for international um, clients. Now, this is important, two points about oil marketing, because some analysts are saying, and, and they are right, they're saying producing more oil doesn't mean that Iran can immediately export more oil, because you obviously have to market that oil. Uh, but the question is, can Iran market that oil? There are two important facts that we have to take into account. First of all, the majority of the Iranian oil is these two categories. Uh, it's basically Iran heavy, which is almost half of the production, and Iran light, sort of the other half. The fact is that global markets, especially Asian markets, are moving more and more towards heavy oil. They, there is a greater demand for heavy oil compared to a few years ago, part, partly because of the developments in, in the world. Uh, so Iran has something that actually customers, especially Asian customers, want. This is important. Secondly, if you look at this, this is exports in 2011, 2012, in terms of, um, this is when sanctions hit. But before sanctions hit, crude oil and liquids, Iran was exporting about 2.5 million barrels a day. And these were the customers. About 500,000 barrels a day to EU customers, which obviously then halved in 2000, and more than halved in 2012, and then was zero subsequently. Now, these customers, most of them would like to go back to Iran for two reasons. One, most of them, and these are Greek, Spanish, Italian refineries who bought Iranian oil, most of them replaced Iranian oil with Russian oil. Now, consider the current atmosphere between Russia and the EU and the desire of refineries to have a longer-term sustainable supplier. So most of them actually do tend, do would like to, and some of them are actually talking to the Iranian uh, oil ministry, petroleum ministry, to actually restart their, um, their oil. And, and some of the other players who sort of reduced their, their imports from Iran, such as South Korea and Japan, as I said, they actually are interested in this he Iran heavy oil. It's not the only heavy oil. Obviously, the Saudis and others have it as well. But some of them have, have had long-term relationships, especially the South Korean refineries with Iran, and they would like to go back. So marketing an additional 500,000 barrels a day of oil in 2016 is not impossible. It's obviously not easy, but it's also not impossible. So I would, I would argue that about 500,000 barrels a day of Iranian oil will be added to the international supply beyond implementation day. 
and they will not be able to increase production overnight, but they have about 30 million barrels of oil in storage, which can make up the difference. So hitting the markets with about four to 500,000 barrels a day of, of new oil is, is very feasible. Um, so is, is there going to be an impact on, on, on price? First of all, I do believe that the psychological impact of the nuclear deal has already been accounted for. I mean, Ed can tell us more. But when you look at the price on the 10th of July, which was $55, and then you look at what happened after the announcement of the nuclear deal, that sort of roughly $10 that the oil dropped, I believe one of the main reasons was the Iranian nuclear deal. Even though there was not an immediate supply impact, but the psychological impact was there. And then on the other side, when you, when you think that the Iranian oil supply, if, if Richard and I are, are correct, and it, it will sort of emerge in the first half of 2016, uh, it will sort of be parallel to a number of other developments. We know that because of the price situation, some of the shale production is, is declining. Uh, I do personally expect a, a reaction in the OPEC meeting. There will be another OPEC meeting in December. And there will be some accommodation, even though no one is going to admit it, but there will be some accommodation, potentially from, uh, from Saudi Arabia, uh, to sort of accommodate the new Iranian production. So I personally believe, and, and I look forward to discussing that with, with Richard and Ed, that there will be no dramatic price impact. There will be basically the 500,000 barrels a day of Iranian oil is going to be accommodated through other developments in the market. And in any week or any month, uh, when you look at the oil market, there are events that will take some, a few hundred thousand barrels away or add a few hundred thousand barrels. So I don't imagine a price collapse because of the Iranian re-entry into the markets. So with that, let's just spend a few minutes on gas. Iran, as I said, according to the, oh, sorry. This was not the idea. No, it's back. Uh, according to the BP statistical review, Iran now has the largest gas reserves in the world. But when you look at the production level, Iran has about 18% of the world's reserves, but produces about 5% of, um, of the gas supply. And you can see there is a lot of potential for upside. But when you look at how uh, Iranian gas production has increased over the past decades, especially over the past decade, this year, uh, you see there, there is a clear emphasis on, incre on increasing gas production. Initially, you could say it was a, a, a way of uh, releasing more and more oil for export. But in the meantime, this production, which will basically lead to a production level, if everything if all the projects that are being implemented right now uh, finish in, on time, even with a couple of years of delay, by 2020, Iran's production will be about 300 billion cubic meters a year. And by 2020, uh, 2025, 360. But this, this target will depend a lot on uh, foreign investment and foreign technology coming. But this one, the first one, is quite achievable. These are projects that are already in the pipeline. Uh, and that means that by that year, by 2020, Iran will have a major surplus that can be used to either increase exports or do other things with gas. And I will show you what the Iranian vision is. Uh, this is the official document of the Iranian uh, Ministry of Petroleum on what they call Gas Vision 2025. Um, now, obviously, we are long-term oil exporters. So the first thing, the first idea with gas is always what can we do to increase our oil uh, exports. So one is, as I said, as they will ad dedicate as much as possible to domestic consumption. They will use gas to inject oil fields, aging oil fields, to increase oil production. But there will still be a lot more gas, and there will be an emphasis on gas-based industries. The future of Iran will be about gas-based industries. And I will uh, explain a little bit more. Basically, this is about steel, 
aluminum, cement, petrochemicals. In fact, many people don't know, but Iran is already the third largest producer of cement in the world. Iran produces more cement that, than the United States. And, and this, is, this is important to understand. So the gas potential of Iran, even though it's huge, is not necessarily, even though they mention it, export gas to regional countries, Indian subcontinent and Europe, the, the real emphasis here is export gas on to, to the regional countries. And I will show you the, the, the nas na uh, uh, national and regional grid that Iran is, is investing in. So there will be a, a, an emphasis on gas-based industries and an export to the region. And to the region is actually important uh, because uh, another important fact about our region, the entire Persian Gulf countries, uh, even though they have the, the you know, they're the, one of the biggest hubs of hydrocarbon resources, but with the exception of Iran and Qatar, every single country in our region is gas short, needs gas imports in the future, including Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, and so the question is, where will this gas come from? And one of the answers is obviously one of the sources could be Iran. We know that political tensions and other issues stand in the way, but Iran is already exporting to a number of countries. Now, what are the obstacles to achieving this vision? These, these are my, uh, my statements here. One is energy efficiency. Iran has a very, still very low energy efficiency, and, and obviously it could release even more energy for export if it were more energy efficient. In fact, uh, saving one barrel of oil in Iran is actually cheaper than producing one barrel of oil because there are very basic uh, things that you can do in the residential sector, in the industrial sector, in the power generation sector to actually save energy. And that could be one of the obstacles to achieving all these results. The other one is energy subsidies. Iran, even though it has started a subsidy removal program, it still has a lot of challenges there. And then gas pricing. Iran has a lot of gas. Iran has a lot of potential for gas export, but gas pricing is one of the, one of the problems where they need a, a clear strategy. I told you I will show you the, the grid. Iran's idea about the region is to try to create a, a multi-supplier, multi multi-consumer gas grid. Uh, Iran already imports gas from Turkmenistan. Um, it already exports to Turkey. It is investing to export to Iraq here. It has signed agreements to export to Oman, potentially negotiates with Kuwait. At some point, would like to also connect Qatar, which is obviously another major gas producer to this grid. And the idea is to create that loop. And for example, that's one of the reasons why they have planned this, this link, uh, to really create a loop system to go around the country and connect. And there are a lot of markets. I mean, Pakistan is interested. Afghanistan potentially is interested. Iraq, as I said. At some point, Saudi Arabia, one form or in one form or the other, will need this gas. It can come from Iran or it can come from Qatar. It can come in the form of gas or it can come in the form of electricity. Iran is already uh, exporting a lot of electricity to the neighbors as well. So the energy dynamics of Iran as I said, goes far beyond just oil uh, and includes the gas and electricity dimensions as well. So let me conclude. Uh, obviously, the, the emerging uh, sanctions relief will have an impact on, on oil and gas production in, in Iran. In 2016, we will witness a, 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 an increase. But my, my prediction is this increase is not going to shock international markets. It will be incremental, uh, both in terms of oil but also some of the, the other products that I was mentioning. Iran wants to be a major producer of oil, gas, but also petroleum and petrochemical products by 2020. And the, the decision they have, the strategic decision they have made is to become more and more of a value add producer uh, in the long run. Uh, that means that a lot of the investments, for example, in the petrochemical sector is to go down the chain value chain and add more or value with new investments. Um, they say themselves, Iranian authorities, when you talk to them, they say by 2020, Iran will produce 6 million barrels uh, of oil. 
Uh, I doubt it. I think 5 million barrels of oil production by 2020 is more realistic, but that again will depend on a lot of investment, uh, foreign investment and, and foreign technology. Uh, the gas uh, production uh, projection, the 360 BCM per year by 2020 is more realistic. These are projects that are already in the pipeline. The oil will be, will be difficult. Um, however, this all means a, 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 uh, an investment volume of about $185 billion. And we know that this is going to be a challenge. Uh, and, and to add to what Richard said about mismanagement and, and other issues in Iran, uh, I always say that, that even if all the sanctions disappeared tomorrow and there were no sanctions risks, there would still be a lot of legal, operational, political, and other issues in Iran which need to be tackled. So, the market will open, but the, the real flow of foreign investment and foreign technology will take a different pace depending on the pace of reform and change, uh, change in the country. So I don't think they can absorb all these $185 billion, but the, they, will, they will definitely achieve some of their goals. Financing is a key issue, it's clear. Uh, and uh, I just repeat what, what basically Richard said, foreign companies who are looking at Iran, first of all, you have to know sanctions are still in place. You have to wait for implementation day for the lifting of the sanctions. But as I said, you have to also analyze all the other types of risks that exist. I'll stop here and look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard and Bijan. I think those, those of us who are familiar with presentations on both of these subjects would acknowledge that these are really terrific presentations, the record uh, that is uh, here because it was live streamed and will be available for others, uh, whether uh, they're ac in the academic world or in the business world, uh, I think uh, speaks to this uh, good contribution that both of you have, have made to the debate. Uh, we are open for questions, so uh, tell me who wants to start, uh, Davoud. And, and Leela, do I need to repeat the questions for the live streaming or do we oh, have a, a mic? There is a microphone. Okay, there is a mic behind you. Thank you very much for a very good presentation. I have a couple of questions and comments. First, do you think that... Uh, uh, Devil, could you introduce yourself before... Yes, Davu Tari, and I have worked in the Iran oil and gas industry in the past, and also in OPEC. So I should have some information from the past. Uh, there was a pipeline pr project called Nabucco, which was supposed to get uh, to take Iranian gas to Europe. Is the, that project is still alive or is going to be replaced by LNG? And uh, going back to the OPEC, in case the political relation between Iran and Saudi changes, nothing is going to happen in OPEC. Because uh, as I said, I have been in OPEC and I, I know how they work. Yes, they could uh, come, up with, come over with their problems very quickly and uh, if there is a, let's say, telephone call from Iran or from uh, King of Saudi Arabia to the other side, I'm sure they will be coming together and they could come to a good agreement in OPEC. But based on what's going on in recent uh, months and also this tragic uh, accident that happened in Mecca, it's a little bit premature that uh, Saudi Arabia is going to help Iran to accommodate its, uh, let's say, oil. And on the Persian Gulf, again, yes, it is true that Kuwait, UAE, they have been all negotiating with Iran in the past, but over the past few years, of course, because of, again, political reasons that have not gone, uh, let's say, further. But there is a good potential. Obviously, Kuwait, UAE, and Oman, and all of those countries, as mentioned, are going to be a good potential customers for, for Iran. Thank you very much. Do you want to comment? Thank you. Um, Nabucco, uh, if you remember, in, it, in its original design, uh, did not actually include supplies from Iran. This was one of, the, one of the emotional downsides from the Iranian perspective, because it actually was relying on supplies from the Caspian region, and even 
included some future connection from Iraq, but because of the political atmosphere and because of the sanctions, it never included a link from Iran. Um, in the meantime, some of the key players uh, who were planning Nabucco, who were actually obviously looking for an alternative supply of gas for, for the European Union, are considering Iran again. But um, two things have happened. One is that the Nabucco in its original form does not exist anymore. There is only a company called West Nabucco, which uh, it basically has included some of the work and pipeline uh, outside Turkey. So west of Turkey to, to up to Austria is still a pipeline infrastructure company. That's it. Um, secondly, uh, the, my personal view, that's why I said that Iran will, will be hesitant to uh, export gas to Europe. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, I do believe that there has, there, there, there has been an emotional negative impact of the sanctions of the past decade. Uh, the Iranians are not going to create a situation where they are dependent on the Europeans. Creating a pipeline and exporting gas through a pipeline to Europe will somehow it will be interdependency, but will actually create a degree of dependency uh, that Iran doesn't like. That's why your second comment about LNG is, is definitely uh, a potential. And today, when you go to the Minister of Petroleum in Iran, one of the buzzwords is floating LNG. They talk a lot about floating LNG because they have pockets of gas, especially in the south, that could potentially be used for, for floating LNG production. So we have to see. Uh, where that goes. Um, I think the other points were just comments. Thank you for those comments. A quick, one. quick one. But wait for a mic. Wait for a mic. Uh, just a correction. Nabucco, it's true that the original did not happen. There was a serious negotiation between Iran and some of the European sure. countries. I, I don't want to name them, but it was serious even they were discussing uh, even the price. So it, it was. Can I just add Richard, one? Go ahead. Just add one thing on the issue of LNG. I mean, I think, and this may or may not be true any further, but certainly one of the issues that was associated with the running develop of LNG was who was holding all the patents for a lot of very important LNG technologies, and a lot of them were, were residing here in the United States. An important qualification to make with regard to sanctions relief is that it will not include U.S. unilateral sanctions in the U.S. primary embargo, which basically means that most things that are in the United States will not be able to go to Iran. Mm -hmm. To me, that is going to impair, inhibit, make more difficult um, LNG development inside of Iran. I don't think it will necessarily prohibit it. Um, certainly, it's been a few years since, um, you know, I looked at that issue and saw how much the Iranians might be able to do using uh, non-U.S. sources of technology and expertise. But, but I think that will impair them a little bit as they look to, to move in that direction. To my mind, that may make use of pipelines even more attractive. And, and I would bet that you're going to see them try and move ahead with a pipeline, for instance, to Pakistan, mm -hmm. which has been largely dormant as a result of U.S. sanctions. I think they're going to want to get that in place as soon as possible um, as, as a primary thing, um, and then potentially even see what more they can do with that going beyond it. Okay, just on the pipeline to Pakistan, very quickly, they, they are act Iran is actually building its segment of that pipeline. Uh, the, the bottleneck there is the Pakistani side. And recently, the Chinese offered a loan to Pakistan to build that. So, so that may actually still happen. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Oh, great. Uh, thanks. Uh, Rachel Ziemba from Rubini Global Economics. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how the Iranian parliamentary elections might affect the dynamics and any thoughts that you might have on the way the current government might tackle this balance between attracting investment and trying to also support domestic industries, particularly in energy, but any thoughts you have on this? Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Um, the outcome of the parliamentary elections will definitely have, have a direct impact on uh, how freely the current government can, can actually act. I, I agree with Richard that we now have a government with a lot, a lot of technocrats, especially in the field of economy, industrial management, and so on. But because we have a parliament that's uh, more or less opposed to the Rouhani uh, faction, uh, 
a, a large segment of the government's potential goes into uh, nonsense interactions and communications with the parliament. Uh, there, there are, you know, the parliament intentionally bombards the government with issues and, and, and questions and, and you know, threats of impeachment and so on. So if, if we get a parliament that is more moderate, more on the reformist side and less opposed to the current government, it will definitely have an impact on how efficient and effective the, the government can be and uh, would obviously pave the way for, for a re-election of Rouhani in 2017. These, these are obviously potential, potential outcomes. Uh, and that's why I said the government has a clear interest to get the implementation date or day before the election date. Uh, that would create a momentum. Uh, but even without that momentum, my feeling is that the Iranian people, the electorate, will, uh, will, will opt for, for the more moderate forces if the Guardian Council uh, allows the moderate uh, forces to run. But what happens usually in these elections is that a lot, of the, a lot of the candidates, especially provincial candidates, are actually independent candidates. Or at least when they run, they're independent and then they could develop certain alignments after they get elected. Um, the other fact about the elections is that on the same day, for the first time, we have another election for the first time that they are concurrent. Usually they were not concurrent in the past, but for the first time, uh, on the same day, on the 26th of February, the Iranians will also elect the, the new Assembly of Experts. The Assembly of Experts is a, is a clerical body that uh, supervises and elects the supreme leader. So if it potentially the, the next Assembly of Experts could decide about the succession of, uh, of uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. So that's also another important fact we have to watch. Uh, in terms of the balance between uh, foreign investment or the opening of the market and, and the Iranian industry. This is exactly the reason why uh, wherever you talk to Iranian officials when they talk about the presence of foreign companies in Iran, they say one of the preconditions is that you're prepared to come and enter into a joint venture with Iranian companies. So they realize that there is an Iranian capacity that needs to be included and that it, they want to um, sort of develop in the form of joint ventures. Um, uh, there is some anxiety in the Iranian industry, I'm, I, I can tell you, but there is also more than anxiety. There is optimism that through this uh, cooperation with international companies, they, they can also themselves enter new markets. So uh, I think it can be balanced. It will be, it will be tense initially, but I think it can be balanced. Bijan, is this uh, balancing issue what is responsible for the frequent delaying of uh, discussion of foreign ex con contracts and uh, big meetings taking place between companies and the government? Um, I, I think the main reason for the delays have been uh, the realization that international companies are not going to be able really to enter into any serious discussions before the sanctions are lifted. I think, again, the new date they are suggesting, they have not suggested end of February. Basically, for those who don't know, Iran has been planning a conference in London for the past year or so to, to present the new contractual framework and also new projects for foreign investment. The last relatively um, reliable date was mid-December, and uh, now they have delayed it to, they say, end of February. Now, end of February is along the lines of what my prediction was that they say implementation, implementation day will be February, hence we can then enter into negotiations. But I think if implementation day will be delayed, they will probably delay the, the conference again. There's a question in the front. Hi, Bill Spindle from the Wall Street Journal. Thanks very much. Great presentation. Very interesting. Um, Bijan, can you, uh, given the parameters you've laid out for some of the foreign involvement, how quickly do you think it will grow and how substantial will it be in the industry? And Richard, do the primary sanctions apply across the board to all U.S. companies or is it just oil sector? And how do you expect those companies to handle a situation in the future where their competition is allowed to come into Iran and, and go, uh, given their reluctance in the past to do any lobbying on their own part? You want to go first? Sure. I mean, so um, basic answer is that the primary embargo 
will remain in effect for basically any trade involving the United States and Iran. There, there are certain things that are subject to general licenses already, uh, humanitarian goods, agricultural goods, medicine, uh, that's going to continue. Um, under the Conference of Plan of Action, there's also going to be relief from aviation-related sanctions, so that civil aviation um, support, you know, planes as well as uh, spare parts, can go. Um, but basically, mo most things are going to remain subject to U.S. unilateral sanctions. Telecom won't, but if you're looking at oil and gas, it, it very much will. There is the possibility of a carve-out to this in the form of how foreign incorporated U.S. subsidiaries are going to be treated. So under the Comprehensive Plan of Action, there's a reference to making modification to how foreign incorporated U.S. subsidiaries are going to be treated. So these are, you know, uh, U.S.-owned companies, but they, they are incorporated under the laws of a foreign government. So they're a company that is based in Turkey that for all intents and purposes is Turkish, but just happens to have a U.S. parent. Um, that used to be a sanctions loophole that was closed a few years back, um, and the United States has indicated willingness to look at this. Um, but we haven't yet seen what is going to be permitted and what's not going to be permitted. That's going to be part of this new set of regulations that's going to come out in mid-October. My bet is that you're not going to see sweeping support for sensitive U.S. technologies associated with oil and gas, for instance, being part of that mix. Um, but it could be. Um, there could also be different ways of delineating. You could delineate certain industries are permitted to have foreign incorporated U.S. subsidiary participation. You could have certain goods, that it's okay if you're a foreign subsidiary to sell brooms to Iran, uh, no matter who you are, or it could just be inside certain sectors. But, but again, this is just an important detail that wasn't part of the Comprehensive Plan of Action, but is supposed to come out. And the intent behind it was to avoid actually impairing sanctions relief from foreign companies. What I think the Iranians are worried about is that there be a lot of U.S.-owned foreign companies, more that they even know, don't know about, that are somehow off limits from being able to participate in relief and, and finding that a surprise. They wanted to have some room uh, to deal with that. I mean, ultimately, what does this mean in terms of the political side of things? You know, I, I've spoken with a number of different company executives, and um, what they've indicated time and time again is that the political sensitivities of appearing to lobby to do business with Iran are just simply too great. Um, they all remember the mid-1990s when a lot of companies were subject to intense criticism and protests uh, for, for trading in you know, blood, essentially, with, with, with Iran. And um, those kinds of feelings, those kinds of reputational risks remain. There are a number of groups in the United States that are still opposed to this deal who intend to make reputational risk a high priority for these kinds of companies. I imagine that three or four or five years from now, though, if things are improving on the broader regional stage and if there is movement in dealing with terrorism and human rights violations, so on and so forth, that there will be a new moment to look at this issue. But I think it's going to take that. It's going to take both time, implementation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action successfully, as well as some sort of broader accommodation on regional issues before companies are going to start to say it's worth the reputational harm to look to try and do this business. Thanks. Um, the, the, first of all, as, as a just general statement, international companies, international oil companies, are very interested in the Iranian uh, sector, petroleum sector. Essentially, in the current oil price scenario, if you if you have access to low oil low low cost oil production, then then you would be attracted. So, despite all the difficulties that we see, there is a genuine uh, interest, and I do think that once this conference takes place, we will see a lot of international companies uh, looking at Iran. Uh, but if you want to draw a timeline, let's imagine. February, the conference takes place. They pre uh, present the new contractual framework and about 40 projects. Then en they enter into negotiations. It will be well into 2017, maybe second half of 2017, when the first contracts will be signed because of the, all the complexities and the joint venture negotiations and so on. Let's say 2017, they start some projects. The earliest point they're going to hit Production is 2020, in my view. 2020 will be uh, when Iranian, the new Iranian production will come on stream because of new investments. There will be some production coming on stream because of the changes Iran made. I mean, we have to look at uh, what happened in 2012 when they uh, drove down production. 
some of the production was driven down by reducing the gas injected into the fields. Those fields can produce more if you inject more gas, and we saw the gas is available. So there will be additional production uh, from available resources, but new production uh, will, I think, th that's why I said the six million barrels a day scenario that they're looking at is unrealistic for 2020. It's re probably realistic for 2025 <coughs> if, if everything goes according to plan with new projections and so on. The other factor you have to take into account is that Iran has uh, roughly two, a, a, a capacity of 200 to 250,000 barrels a day of production capacity gets depleted every year because of the old age of, of the Iranian fields. And that obviously has an impact on production capacity. So even if everything goes well and they can revive some of their production and increase some production out of own devices and so on, there will still be uh, you know, that volume to be, to be compensated for in the production projections. Uh, that's why I say look at gas more intensively than oil, because gas, the gas production levels are increasing steadily. Also in the front. I'm Peter Kellerman, Columbia University Earth Science. Uh, could you outline the procedures for snapback? Are there any unambiguous triggers that have been decided in advance, or does the P5 plus 1 have to agree that violations have occurred, and how much politics enters into that? So there haven't been any agreements on exactly what would trigger snapback. Um, and that's, to some extent, uh, to avoid creating red lines under which everything else is assumed to be good, right? You, you wouldn't want to establish anything other than full compliance with the JCPOA as being the requirement. And so therefore, anything that is inconsistent with the JCPOA would be considered a violation and potentially subject to snapback. Now, the United States, for its part in congressional testimony, has made clear that we understand why some might think that's unreasonable and that that's unrealistic. If a valve happens to be out of place in an Iranian nuclear facility, you're hardly going to terminate the entire deal over it. And so the United States, for its part, has said that it would consider um, a more nuanced and more finely tuned snapback if need be. The process on this, though, is laid out in the Comprehensive Plan of Action, um, and it, it basically goes as follows, that um, there can be the start of a complaint from one state with respect to implementation of the JCPOA, including the Iranians. And the Iranians can say, we don't think that we're getting what the deal is supposed to offer. Once a complaint has been received, there is a period of consultation between the uh, country that has complained, as well as all the other participants in the deal. And it can go from basically 15 to 30 days, um, depending on whether or not it's done at a uh, an assistant secretary, senior official level, or if it goes to the foreign minister level, which it can do immediately. There's a possibility for advisory opinions and independent experts to be consulted, but basically after about 45 days of internal consultation within the Joint Commission, a state can decide that it's, it's not being satisfied and that what the Iranians are prepared to do in response is not going to address the underlying problem. Um, by 60 days, the uh, country in question uh, can have submitted to the UN Security Council a resolution on the continuation, repeat that, the continuation of sanctions relief. So it would not be a resolution on whether or not to terminate implementation of the deal, right, under which you could then have a veto from any of the five permanent members. It's whether or not sanctions relief will be continued itself. In other words, if the United States were to decide on day zero that we think the Iranians are cheating, and we think they're cheating over any one thing, after navigating this dispute process, after listening to advisory opinions, and potentially blocking out even hearing them, the United States can prompt the Security Council to review a resolution on continuation, and it can veto that resolution. And it can require, therefore, the immediate snapback of all UN Security Council sanctions. So from a procedural standpoint, if you're willing to play the game, if you're willing to engage in the process and see if the Iranians come up with a resolution, and it could be anything. It could be either agreeing to more restrictions or more transparency. It could be deciding not to do whatever thing is being considered to be inappropriate, and that's happened before. Uh, under the Joint Plan of Action, the Iranians did a number of things that we objected to and said were inconsistent with the terms, and the Iranians stopped doing them. That could happen as well. But if not satisfied, the United States government or any of the other P5 members 
can require a vote at the Security Council and can veto that vote and therefore make sure that snapback is automatically triggered. This, though, I would hasten to note, though, is the legal interpretation of things and how things work. Then there's the political side, right? A Security Council resolution is only as good as people following it. And the context behind deciding to trigger snapback is going to be very, very important. As I said earlier, you're hardly likely to trigger snapback for a valve being out of place, in part because who's going to comply with the UN Security Council resolution jammed down their throats over a missing valve? Hardly anybody. On the other hand, if there were to be some unambiguously bad new development, a new enrichment plant that's discovered that was supposed to be declared but wasn't, or so on and so forth, then I think the context for forcing snapback and actual implementation of snapback will be much stronger. So there's both the legal side and the political side. The legal side is unambiguously positive from the perspective of snapback and automaticity. Whether or not you can get people to comply with it is going to be a, a function of how credible the problem is that you use snapback to deal with. Can I, can I add one? I mean, I agree with everything Richard said, but I think one one layer of or one dimension of politics we have to also watch is uh, all the geopolitical developments in the region because I think one of the one of the key dividends uh, of of this deal and we are sort of seeing the first signs actually during this UN General Assembly right now is that maybe Iran and the US would would cooperate uh, more on some of the regional issues and if and and also. Uh, if you look at it from the European perspective, it's obvious some of these geopolitical developments are also now becoming headaches for, for Europe, the European Union. So once, once the, all sides feel that in the, in the new atmosphere they can tackle some of the issues more efficiently, the, there will be greater resistance to come back with, with snapback if, if there is a, an incident. So I think geopolitical and general political developments are very important. There's a question uh, here on the left. Hi, Wahid Sheikh, Moody's Investor Service. Um, Bijan, I was wondering if you could comment on the um, contractual framework uh, that's been in place and how that's been changing or discussions have changed over the past few weeks. And then my second question is I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how you see the first few years of foreign investment in the oil and gas infrastructure. You know, do you see capital investment going to upstream projects first or to the midstream infrastructure, um, just referring to the slide that you showed earlier uh, with the gas network. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, the, the contractual framework that uh, Iran had in place for investments in the oil and gas sector uh, was called the buyback. Buyback was a, uh, was a service contract which uh, basically uh, determined the framework uh, for investors to come in, invest in a, in, a, in a new oil and gas field, and then basically be compensated by a segment of the production. For example, if it was a gas project, by, by the gas condensate from that field, if it was an oil project, by a segment of the oil production. So, um, uh, the situation that the foreign investment wo investor was in was that there would be an investment, but there would be a, a, a very defined uh, compensation, basically initial investment plus agreed, uh, agreed fees and agreed uh, interest, uh, and that would be all. In, in the language of the oil and gas industry, there was no real upside. Basically, if you, if you achieve the better results, there was absolutely no upside. And then the other problem with the buyback was that there were defined uh, uh, ceilings for uh, capital expenditure and, and operational expenditure and so on. And these were all issues. And the worst thing about the buyback was it, it was telling the foreign investor, you come, you invest, uh, you get the, the field to production, and at production time, you hand it over to the NIOC. And then we will decide whether you did a good job or not. And oil companies were saying, but the real issue is ma managing the production. I mean, we have brought it to this point, but managing the production will be important. So now all of these shortcomings have been addressed in the new contractual framework, which is now called Iran Petroleum Contract. So IP, you will start seeing IPC as one of the references to Iran Petroleum Contract. Now it's a much longer term contract. The, the, the ceilings that I mentioned have been removed, so every year it can be revised and, and they can come up with new, uh, uh, new agreed 
capital expenditure and operating expenditure. It will be a joint venture between the foreign company and an Iranian company. Uh, so the risks and rewards will be, will be shared. And there will be a longer term pro uh, agreement which includes the uh, sort of exploration and production phase, but also the, the production management phase. So all of these issues have been addressed at, le at least in the framework. Uh, but I always say a contract in Iran or contractual framework is really only clear once the first one has been negotiated. Because there are still a lot of ambiguities that need to be clarified. Uh, and once the first one has been negotiated, then we will, we will know uh, what the framework is. Uh, but it still is a service contract. It's not a production sharing agreement. But it's the closest that Iran could get to the production sharing agreement within the Iranian constitution and legal provisions. Uh, the, the, the investment plans that the NIOC and, and Ministry of Petroleum have actually are clearly defined. Be, between now and 2020, they want to invest about $60 billion in upstream projects, uh, about uh, $20 billion in, in downstream projects, and downstream means refineries and so on. I'm not talking about midstream, downstream. And the largest volume of production will actually go into petrochemicals. About $70 billion will go into petrochemicals. Uh, and then some in infrastructure pipelines and so on. So they have actually clear ideas. And you can see, what that's what I mentioned, because of the, the lower margins in, in uh, petroleum products, they have reduced the original plans in terms of adding a lot of capacity to, to refining capacity. So they will mainly focus on on the one side increasing oil and gas production, but on the other side increasing the petrochemical capacity to add value to the gas. There is one here. Ken. Ken. Yeah, I... I Can you identify yourself there? Hmm? Identify yourself, please. Oh, Jim Arrowsmith. I'm a retired oil economist and flaneur. Uh, if you will, but I'm, I'm very interested in the relationship generally between people who are discussing oil or gas industries and the people over at the Earth Institute and in Paris discussing global warming. And I wonder if Iran will be part of the negotiations in Paris and how anything that might practically or feasibly happen there would affect the plans you discuss? Uh, yes, Iran is part of the, the climate change negotiations and part of the Paris conference. Iran has actually a, a, a very uh, vocal uh, vice president who is in charge of uh, environmental protection, uh, Mrs. Eptekar, uh, and she has been uh, uh, attending all these meetings, at least since she has taken over their responsibility since 2013. Uh, uh, from one point of view, you can say Iran's emphasis on gas, increasing the share of gas in its domestic consumption and, and promoting gas, is actually in line with uh, the overall uh, requirements because this is, gas is definitely a cleaner fuel compared to oil and, and, and uh, coal, definitely. Iran has very, very negligible amounts of, of coal in its, in its basket. Uh, and, and obviously gas is on the rise, 70% of domestic consumption is on gas. So Iran's emphasis on gas is important, but Iran will have uh, a major, major challenge in terms of managing its uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, Iran still flares a lot of gas, which is one of the biggest problems. Iran's, as, as I said, Iran's uh, consumption profile and, and, and efficiency, energy efficiency, and efficiency in, in industrial energy use is very low, needs to be improved. So there is a lot to do, and I'm sure, depending on what happens in Paris and what is, what is agreed, there will be consequences on Iran. But to be fair to them, some of these issues they're addressing. For example, they're, 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 they're looking very, very uh, uh, you know, uh, intensely at energy efficiency issues. They're looking at uh, stopping gas flaring, but a lot of these issues are also uh, technological issues that you know, have been barred through, through the sanctions. Uh, for years, Richard may remember, I, I said for years, 
And you know, one of the goodwill signs, uh, gestures towards Iran would be to allow Iran to, to, to store uh, carbon, basically the carbon capture technologies could have been uh, given to Iran, but it wasn't. So there is a, there is a gap, technological gap, uh, and obviously there is a, a, a operational gap which they need to fill. And as I said, depending on what happens in Paris, there will be consequences for Iran. But the attention, at least the, the, the environmental attention is there. Whether they manage to implement all the changes, is, is we will have to see. Just one, one additional element to that, too, and it, it's not, at least not entirely inspired by issues of climate change, but, but rather just the idea of a diversified economy. The, the Iranians have also been trying to develop other industries for a number of years, and not to be singly dependent on oil or gas, you know, which has got so many different uh, bottlenecks that you could uh, impose via sanctions. So for instance, the Iranians have sought to develop a very large auto industry. And for a time, it looked like it was going to be one of the largest in the Middle East. And then uh, sanctions and difficulties you know, took that down a peg. But I, I think you would still see, from a broader Iranian economic perspective, an effort to diversify the economy to make it such that um, a loss of oil and gas revenue, for whatever reason, long term, would not be the death knell of the Iranian economy. And you could see at least some advantages also in terms of dealing with, with climate change as part of that. In the very back, and I note that there are a whole bunch of hands in a limited amount of time, so we'll see how many we get to. It's uh, John Van Schaik with Energy Intelligence. Uh, a question on, on Russia. Russia is moving closer to Iran in terms of security. Um, do you think that that cooperation between the two countries might uh, widen uh, to energy? Uh, would this make Russia more of a favorite candidate for investments into Iran? There are two reasons why uh, Iran-Russia relations have improved over the past few years. Uh, the first obvious reason is obviously the pressure from Western governments and Western countries uh, pushed Iran towards Russia on, on some questions where Iran needed foreign technology and, 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 and foreign cooperation. But the second reason is, is really uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the strategic choices over the past couple of years, and that has to do with um, uh, the fact that a lot of the more conservative and more hardline forces in Iran who look at this nuclear deal as a uh, sort of first step towards improving relations with the US and improving relations with the Western world, uh, are very concerned, and, and the government's response has been to try to balance Iran's international relations, to say it's not just about uh, better relations with the US or better relations with Europe, it's about better relations with the world, and look at what we are doing with Russia, and look at what we are doing with China and India, and so on. So even well before the, the nuclear deal, for example, Iran signed a, 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 an agreement with Russia to to increase bilateral trade tenfold within a few years, you know, from $1.5 billion to $15 billion. And a lot of that will also include investments and, and trade in, in oil equipment, in, in uh, other industrial sectors, and so on. But having said all of this, uh, I know for a fact that uh, Russian technology and Russia as a source of technology is not necessarily fully accepted by the Iranian technocrats. The preference goes towards the West. Right now, because of the sanction situation, more towards Europe. Uh, and, and Russia will come in uh, and play a bigger role in areas where the Western governments will be bar or Western companies will be barred, like um, you know, the arms sector, uh, nuclear technology, and, and, and so on. Uh, emotionally, also, I can tell you that uh, uh, at least with the current government in, 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 in power, uh, the, the, the tendency would be more towards Western Europe rather than, rather than Russia. But Russia is a powerful neighbor. Uh, Russia and Iran have a lot of common interests in the region. And, but I have to, to be fair to, to the Iranians, a lot of it was driven by the sanctions policies of the past few years, and not necessarily by a strategic choice from Iran. Just if I could elaborate on the question, which had an energy element to it. Um, 
you in your slides made a very convincing case, and you and I have discussed this before, with uh, the incentive for European refiners uh, to move away from the Urals diet that they've taken post-sanctions. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this is not exactly a win-win situation in terms of mm -hmm. Iranian-Russian energy relations. And I wonder if you can comment on that part sure, of it. Sure, sure. Um, it's definitely not win-win, but if you look at the, 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 the more um, global uh, process, um, one of the things that the Russians would hear very gladly is that Iran will not necessarily push towards exporting gas to Europe. Uh, that is where I think the main Russian concern could be with Iranian developments. And I know that a lot of the Europeans would like to see Iran as a gas supplier to Europe to actually counterbalance uh, the, the Russian uh, thing. There, there was a comment about Nabucco. One of the reasons why Nabucco made a lot of sense was that actually, if you look at the, the entirety of the European Union, the main bottleneck in terms of supplies is Southeast Europe. It's basically exactly where Nabucco would have come in with supplies. But look at the, what the Russians did. The, the, they are replacing South Stream with Turkish Stream, and if that happens, and there is no reason why it shouldn't happen, you suddenly have a Turkish-Russian solution for Southeast Europe, which would also make some of the Iranian, potential Iranian supplies redundant. So, uh, if yes, the, on oil, I think there will be some, some competition, uh, on, and also on other uh, potentially future products, there could be some competition, but I think, uh, in gas, the Russians will be very happy to see that Iran is not necessarily pushing towards pipeline exports to Europe. Great. I think we have time for one more question in the front. My name is Fedra Fateh, and my question is for Mr. Nephew. Uh, most people in the room are old enough to remember when Iran uh, was a U.S. ally. Um, and for those of us who have an appreciation of the distinct cultures and history, let's say, between Iran versus, say, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, uh, it's hard to understand why the U.S. government is not willing to hold uh, the various countries in the Middle East to the same standard. So, for example, if the justification for the U.S. sanctions against Iran is terrorism and human rights, uh, why are we not holding Saudi Arabia to the same standard? Well, I mean, I think a large part of it comes down to the issue of, of government sponsorship. I mean, there, there was a determination made in the mid-'80s that Iran was directly sponsoring acts of terrorism um, in, in a fashion that I don't think um, has been replicated elsewhere. Certainly, there have been citizens of various different countries around the region who have been in, involved in acts of terrorism, but that's not the definition under which we, as a legal act, impose state sponsorship of terrorism sanctions. I think, frankly, there's also a, a, a different issue with respect to the degree to which um, activities uh, threaten some of our fundamental interests and partnerships in the region. And the reality, I think, is that Iranian behavior since the revolution has been more inimical to a lot of our partners in, region, in the region um, than vice versa. Now, are, is it true that there is a dose of uh, hard feelings still from the hostage crisis and from acts of terror engaged against U.S. Uh, you know, military personnel at Kobar Towers and Beirut Barracks. Yes, I, I think that's that's certainly a part of it. And I think that the Iranian government would, would argue as well that there are still reasons why they themselves would have difficulty cooperating with the United States. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily put this down to a uh, perceived double standard of U.S. treatment vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia versus Iran, although certainly the Iranian government would like to, to make that pitch. I think there are differences both in terms of the direct history of Iranian involvement in bad acts, as well as a perception of what we can do to moderate behavior. In the case of Iran, especially after 1979, there, there's not a whole lot of influence the United States can wield in Iran to moderate bad behavior through diplomacy. That's not the case with regard to other countries in the region. And I think there has been a general uh, inclination to use direct contacts and direct um, diplomatic relations to deal with those circumstances in places you know, in, in uh, the Arab world that you simply can't do in Iran because we don't have an embassy there and we don't have the kinds of diplomatic relations that you can have. I mean, I think fundamentally when you get right down to it, there is also, though, uh, a real issue still of, of 
rivalry and adversarial relations between the United States and Iran that's going to le lend itself to use of tools that hurt one another. Um, I hope that the resolution of the nuclear dispute will allow for more positive cooperation on regional problems that eventually can lead to a greater rapprochement. But that, that's going to take time. And it's going to take time, I think, on both sides of the equation, not just only from the United States government's perspective. Well, thank you very much. Can I make a short comment? Thank you. Uh, one of the most significant uh, transformations um, under the Rouhani government, in my view, is, is the promotion of this um, thesis, which is uh, the Iranian foreign minister's thesis himself, the Kozarev thesis, who says, uh, uh, you know, thesis in, this, in an academic sense, I mean, uh, is, which says, if, if your security policy creates a detriment to someone else's security, that's not going to generate security. It's, in, in, other, in other words, think of win-win situations. And, and I think the nuclear deal is a win-win situation. And Iran, at least this government, Iran is a very complex uh, political structure, but this government do, does believe in win-win in, in situations. You could hear it also in, in President Rouhani's speech today at the UN and, and in other comments. And I think this is where we all have to contribute. Instead of th talking about the past, let's come up with some win-win scenarios for the future. And that's why I mentioned the gas factor. For me, the gas factor is one of the most significant platforms for win-win win -win scenarios. Iran can export more gas. Other countries can import the gas they need to become more efficient producers of energy and, and, and other products. And I think uh, since we are talking about energy, the gas factor should be highlighted in this context. Thank you. I think I speak for everybody in thanking you both very much for this really insightful uh, discussion. Um, we hope you're coming back someday, too. Thanks Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now, as normal, there'll be time to uh, have some chit-chat for those of you who want to stick around. Thanks. Richard, great to do.